This is the Chiefs' official podcast network. Radio Row here at the Indianapolis Convention Center, home of the 2020 NFL Scouting Combine. I'm BJ Kissel. Thanks for tuning in to In the Trenches. Uh, unfortunately, Nick was not able to make it up here to Indy, so you've got me by myself for the first half of this show, and then we've got a special guest joining in the second half of the show later. But, you know, every year, the NFL world descends upon Indianapolis for this week for the Combine. 32 NFL head coaches, 32 general managers and their personnel staffs, along with 330 37 of the top draft eligible prospects in this year's class will be here over the next week coming in different waves and uh, more than a thousand credentialed media are here and it's going to be a whole lot of fun we've got a lot of cool content planned for you guys back there and I appreciate you tuning in to this podcast but um, since its inception the NFL scouting combine was about medical testing that's how this whole thing started uh, when it was brought up years ago and that's what the most important part of this is. And you've also got the interviews and the workouts and the things that you see on TV. Um, but a lot of the evaluation and things that are happening are the things that the most important things are happening behind the scenes. Again, it's the medical testing, it's the psychological evaluating, it's the, the height, weight, speed, all those things are a part of it, but it's really a chance for these guys for the first time for a lot of these players to sit down in front of these decision makers, these head coaches, these general managers, these personnel guys, the scouts and all of uh, the people who are tasked with making these decisions and trying to put their best foot forward. And uh, that's what we're going to talk about here over the next 30 minutes or so. Uh, but for the Chiefs, who hold the beautiful number 32 overall pick in the ja draft as they are Super Bowl champions, both Andy Reid and Brett Veach spoke with the media and had their press conferences earlier today. I've got some takeaways that I will go through from those media availabilities here in a little bit. I um, also spoke with those guys off to the side, and we've got a little package we cut up with, uh, with a couple of their answers as well. And also had a chance to catch up with NFL. NFL Network's Charles Davis, uh, who's here breaking things down for NFL Network and is one of the top guys out there, both in just pure knowledge of the game, but also in just being a phenomenal dude. Had a chance to talk with him about a lot of different things, and we'll cut one of those answers, a little snippet, uh, in that package soon. And then in the second half of the show, we're going to be joined by Chiefs Director of Football Operations, Mike Borgonzi. He is one of those, he's Brett Veach's right-hand guy and somebody that when you, you talk about all the moves the Chiefs have made, whether it was the draft last year or free agency, or trades, or whatever it is, that it's not just Brett Veach, it's his entire staff, and Mike is a huge part of that, and we're going to have Mike on to talk for a while just about the processes, what they've been going through over the past few weeks, and then obviously what they're going to be doing this week and kind of looking ahead. So this is a chance for us to to get into a lot of different things. Like I said, uh, we are here on Radio Row, so you're going to see for everybody watching on YouTube, watching live, you're going to see a lot of things going on around me. Uh, it should be a whole lot of fun. It's, uh, it's the center of the NFL world for the next week, um, and internally our franchise guys for everybody who didn't catch that season finale go back and watch that the franchise guys are here um, they had coach reed and brett veach mic'd up um, earlier today when they were going around doing their media stuff so uh, some fun stuff there and um, also have a lot of cool content coming to chief social channels whether it's talking with national media like i did earlier today with charles davis um, we're gonna talk with daniel jeremiah on wednesday along with field yates uh, matt miller a bunch of other guys that we're going to catch up with um, should be a whole lot of fun on uh, the chief social channels talking past present and future and what i mean by that is talking past in the super bowl win we're not past it chiefs fans are still celebrating we're it hasn't quite sunk in for everybody yet still feeling pretty surreal so uh, still going to talk about that and just you know get everyone's perspective on what the coolest part for them was going through um, the Super Bowl run that the Chiefs had and then present obviously talking about the scouting combine what's going on this week uh, for a lot of fans they aren't necessarily thinking about the draft quite yet um, they have that luxury but unfortunately for our scouting staff this is what they do they do not have that luxury so when we talk with Mike we talk with Brett and some of these guys throughout the week catch up with some of the other area scouts um, they're all in on the combine right now which they have been uh, for the last few weeks going through and setting their draft board putting their grades in and all that stuff and then obviously talking about the future and that is free agency that is the nfl draft past that uh, schedule release all that good stuff is coming down the road but um, this episode 
Today is going to be kind of putting a recap and kind of going past, present, and future. We are going to have another episode of In the Trenches that's coming live, and that will be on Friday um, with my co-host, Therese Baylor, is going to help me out for that one, and that's going to be more draft-centric. That's going to be talking about players, prospects. Once we've had a chance to talk with those kids this week, watch them work out a little bit, talk with some of the, the experts around here, what they're saying about this draft class. So that's going to be more of the Friday episode if that's what you're looking for. Uh, but we got a lot of cool stuff for this show. And I want to start with the basics right here on the Scouting Combine for any Anybody who's aware of what the combine is, maybe you just think that when you flip on the TV, uh, which starts Thursday at 3 p.m. as all the workouts are now in prime time, um, but the combine is so much more than that. And I want to get into a little bit of that right now. And it's basically 337 of the top draft eligible players in this year's draft come in. And they come in in four different waves and they do it um, over seven different days. And so the first wave of players that came in, which would be your tight ends, your wide receivers, and your quarterbacks, they all arrived on Sunday, and that was their first of their five-day combine experience. And then the second wave of players come in the next day. They come in Monday, and that is the kickers, the offensive line, and the running backs. And then Tuesday, it's the defensive linemen and the linebackers. And then Wednesday, it's the defensive backs. So they come in in different waves, and it kind of staggers what they have each of those days. So um, the tight ends, quarterbacks, and wide receivers on Sunday, they had their registration, their orientation, and then their interviews. And then Monday, they had measurements, uh, their exam at the hospital, and interviews. And then Tuesday, they've got more medical exams. They've got media availability, uh, which is what they have going on today, uh, position coach interviews, and then psychological testing, and then going on from the week, they've got the bench press, more psychological testing, and then they've got their on-field workout on that final day, and that, for the first group, again, will be Thursday, 3 p.m. in prime time. You will see those workouts. Uh, it's the first time the NFL's done this. It's one of the things I want to ask Mike Borgonzi about is just how things change for them now that the NFL has decided to move those workouts to prime time, but um, that's kind of a, a basic look at what these guys have going on, and I think it's always interesting to know that they've got four full days of getting up early in the morning late at night they've got meetings with uh, with different nfl teams whether it's an informal which is just stopping somebody in the hallway or just uh, a quick chat um, and then they've got uh, formal interviews which teams can I believe have only between like 40 and 50 there's a set number uh, maybe like 45 set formal interviews that they're allowed to have that they schedule uh, at 15 minutes that they bring guys in and talk with them and um, we're not allowed in those meetings but that's where they they get to know the players find out what makes them tick and it's obviously something the Chiefs have been good about uh, getting the right kind of guys uh, in their locker room so guys who love football, guys who um, you know, are practicing hard uh, for their college teams on Tuesday afternoons when their teams are 500, you know, those kind of things that our area scouts look for. Because when you get guys that buy in in the right time, when you're down 24 nothing in the divisional round of a playoff game, you're not worried about those guys being locked in and ready to go. So um, that's why those meetings are so important. But uh, again, those days are packed, and it's that fifth day, that last day that the guys are here, they're actually doing those on-field workouts. Uh, so it's a grueling pace. These guys are they're picked apart, um, they're poked, they're prodded, they're tested in every different way uh, so these teams can get as much information as possible when they're making decisions on who they want to bring into their organization and to try to help them win a Super Bowl or as in the Chiefs case and it's kind of nice to say now can help them try and defend their Super Bowl so um, little housekeeping on the Chiefs in the NFL draft obviously they have the number 32 overall pick in the first round uh, and they've got a pick in each of the first five rounds of this draft they don't have a sixth or seventh round pick as of right now but the compensatory picks will come out later between now and the draft and that takes uh, there's a compensatory formula that is out there on the internet if you want to go find it but uh, it takes into consideration like free agency loss that went and signed with other teams so uh, and then it kind of works against you for free agents that you sign yourself so for the Chiefs they signed Tyron Matthew uh, to a big contract, but Steven Nelson left and went to the Steelers and signed a contract. Mitch Morris left and signed a big deal with the Buffalo Bills, and uh, there's a whole lot that goes into it, playing time, contract, um, dollar amount, all that, um, but it remains to be seen. There's a chance that the Chiefs will end up with another draft pick, but we will not know that for a little while. Um, even if they do, I think the highest comp pick that you can get is like a third rounder, so... Um, it'll probably be a fourth or a fifth for the Chiefs if they do end up getting one. So they may end up with six picks in this draft, but uh, we'll know more on that later. And another interesting nugget that we've got from Brett Veach, and he mentioned it on the podcast that I had with him last week. If you haven't had a chance to check that out, I recommend it. Uh, but one of the other things that he said, and he said it again today that I find really interesting, is that he said last year when they were doing their draft prep that they only had 15 players that had first-round grades. And this year that number is 
already more than 20 players. So it uh, definitely feels like there's a lot more top-end talent in this draft than there was a year ago. Um, but it's also going to be interesting to see as Veach goes into his third draft if the Chiefs end up making a pick in the first round because they haven't in his first two years. Um, and for good reason. If you want to look back at those, they didn't have the uh, first-round pick the first year uh, back in 2018 because they had given it up for the trade for Patrick Mahomes, which... I think looking back on it, I think people would still probably make that trade. I think that's a fair assessment. And then last year, obviously, the move for Frank Clark, uh, which looking at what he did in the playoffs and closing all three postseason games with sacks in the second half of the fourth quarter in all those games, uh, dubbing himself the closer. He had a chance to watch his mic'd up. Um, he was yelling that out on the field before the, the end of the Super Bowl as he closed that one out. But I feel like both those moves worked out pretty well for the Chiefs. So um, well, remains to be seen if the if the Chiefs get a first-round pick. Maybe he moves up, maybe he moves down. Um, it kind of depends. But when you've got more than 20 first-round grades on players, you put yourself in a pretty good situation. And speaking of Brett Veach and obviously Coach Reed as well, as both of them spoke to the media today, I've got five takeaways from today's media availability um, from, again, Brett Veach and Coach Reed, who actually told me that uh, he had 2,500 text messages from friends, family, former coworkers, people that he'd known in his life when he got to his phone after the Super Bowl, when he went to check it, 2,500 text messages. And two of those text messages, I'm assuming, were from both Matt Nagy and Doug Peterson, who I had a chance to catch up with. We'll have a social video on that later, but uh, I want to get their perspective and, you know, where were they, what were they doing when they were watching the Super Bowl, and just what did it mean to them? I had a chance to talk to Ron Rivera and Sean McDermott, a couple other of his assistants before the Super Bowl um, when we were at Radio Row down in Miami. So it was pretty cool to be able to catch up with both Nags and Doug um, as they were walking around, guys I'm familiar with as uh, they were here um, when you know I was covering the team. So that was a whole lot of fun to talk with them. But here are my five takeaways from the press conferences today. The first one is the injury update. Um, the big one is basically Coach Reed was asked about Patrick Mahomes because there were reports out there before that he may need offseason knee surgery um, based on the, the dislocated kneecap that he had against the Broncos earlier in the year. But Coach Reed basically referenced the video that he saw on social media with pa Patrick Mahomes working out with Des Bryant saying that he looks pretty good and that he thinks he's going to be fine. So it made it sound like there's not any surgery this offseason for Patrick Mahomes, which is a great sign. And then Juan Thornhill, update from him via NFL Network's James Palmer, saying that Thornhill, they don't know if he'll necessarily be ready for the start of training camp, but he should be ready for the start of the season, uh, which is a great sign. And uh, Palmer reported that it was better than they thought when they went in and did the surgery and took care of everything. So obviously that's a good sign for a player that um, – had a phenomenal rookie season as a guy that I had a chance to talk with him in the locker room um, after the Super Bowl win, that he was happy he was a part of it, but you could tell there was just part of him uh, that was bummed out that he didn't get to play in that game, and he is fired up to get ready and uh, have a follow-up season to a rookie year that I think was better than uh, anybody may have expected, even the most optimistic guys um, like myself and like the personnel staff and all the guys that watched him down at the Senior Bowl, talked to him at the, the Combine last year. He was just one of those guys, um, as Chiefs fans saw throughout this week, he just has that infectious person personality and uh, that was apparent going down to Mobile last year for the Senior Bowl and obviously at the Combine as well. Um, so those are two injury updates with both Patrick Mahomes and Juan Thornhill. Um, second takeaway, there's been a lot of there was a lot of questions um, for both Coach Reed and Brett Veach about keeping Chris Jones in Kansas City as he is scheduled to become a free agent. The goal, as Brett Veach said, is to keep Chris Jones in Kansas City. Chris Jones has said he wants to stay in Kansas City. Now, there's the business of football. There's a lot of stuff that has to be worked out. But Veach also said that he has scheduled meetings with uh, the Katz brothers. That's um, Chris Jones' representation here in Indy over the next few days. They will be meeting. There's been consistent dialogue, which Brett Veach said is always a good thing. And uh, the one nugget to keep in mind, and Brett Veach said it's not a foregone conclusion that they would use the franchise tag, but obviously it's an option in their pocket if they want to do that. But the window for the franchise tag has been extended um, because of the CBA talks um, in trying to get a new collective bargaining, bargaining agreement done. But the franchise tag window now is February 27th, which is a couple days from now, is the first time that a player can be tagged um, all the way through March 12th. Um, that's the deadline for when players can be tagged. But um, the other thing that Brett said is just the tandem of Frank Clark and Chris Jones is something they'll try to, hard to keep together. Uh, the third takeaway I've got was that there wasn't a, there's not a whole lot of change for Coach Reed and his schedule. Uh, he said that he always goes down to California for a couple of days, flew down on Friday, uh, was there Friday night, um, was, came, hung out, kind of relaxed on Saturday, and then was back to work on Sunday. So for anybody out there who thinks that maybe Coach Reed got his ring and he's going to relax and just go off into the sunset, the guy took 
less basically less than 24 hours off before he started getting back to work which is the same process the same program he's always been on uh when he went out to california now he's back in uh, getting all caught up on draft stuff here um and again we're going to be joined by mike borganzi here in a couple of minutes but um Another takeaway from Brett Veach, crediting his staff um, in a number that I hadn't heard before, just the, the 12 new contributors to the Chiefs defense. Um, Brett Veach, and it's just the nature of the position at general manager, you're going to get all the credit for those guys, but he really credits his staff because it wasn't just about the big moves with Tyron Matthew and Frank Clark, but it was about guys like Charvarius Ward thinking a couple years ago with uh, the trade with the Dallas Cowboys, Terrell Suggs getting picked up midseason, Mike Pinnell, Rashad Fenton, Damone Harris uh, stepped in and played a little bit, and these guys were picked up midseason, and for them to step in and, and make an impact was huge uh, for this defense, and that's not Brett doing everything himself. He's got to get a lot of help, and um, we're, we're going to speak with one of those guys who's helped him out, like I said, Mike Borgonzi here in a couple of minutes, but um, the fifth takeaway I had was that he that Brett Veach will also be meeting with Sammy Watkins' agent, uh, Tory Dandy, this week. Sammy has a year left on his deal. Uh, there's been so much made about his high cap hit in the business of football, but um, Sammy made comments down in Miami about you know what his future could look like. Uh, he said he wants to stay in Kansas City. He loves being in Kansas City, but um, it's definitely something that uh, has made headlines, and a lot of questions have been asked about it. Um, as a guy who made one of the biggest plays in the Super Bowl and definitely um, validated the uh, the deal that Brett Veach and his staff gave to him, uh, helping the Chiefs achieve that Super Bowl victory. Um, but right now, I want to throw to a quick package, just a few minutes, um, with the top quotes or just things that I found interesting from my one-on-ones with Andy Reid, Brett Veach, and Charles Davis earlier today. What's your favorite part of this week? Is it sitting down and, and talking with and getting to know the players or is it just kind of being around everybody here? What is it that you like the most? Well, I love going to the weigh-ins because uh, I get to sit next to Brett and he coaches me up on these guys. Uh, Ryan Pohl started that process when we were back in Kansas City before we got here, but Brett takes it even up another notch for us. And then watching tape on him, I love doing that. And then uh, coming here, actually meeting the kids is, is uh, that... I love that part. Mm. You get your first introduction to them, and even though it's a little bit canned, uh, you can ask some things that, that get in there and uh, kind of loosen them up a little bit. Besides the obvious things that fans see, the workouts, the things going on, what else can get done this week with all of the NFL decision makers and everybody who has a hand in those kinds of things all together in one place for a week? Yeah, I think just dialogue begins at, at such a rapid pace here. Uh, you know, you have 32 head coaches, 32 GMs, you have 32 personnel staff, so, uh, and you're all, if you're not staying at the same hotel, you're staying within blocks of each other, so um, really, you know, the beginning and the start of, of dialogue in regards to player movement and, and where team is headed and what direction begins now, so it's, it's, it's the starting point of free agency, and you gather the information, and then from there you um, put it you know, potentially into a future game plan. But the question now is, how are they set up for an extended run? And for you, when you look at this roster, you look at this team, you're gonna, they have some key moves they got to make yep. in the offseason, they always do. But how are they set up for an extended period of success in your eyes? To me, oh, they've got an offensive line that's mm -hmm. still young enough that you're not saying, <laughs> okay, I got to swap out three guys here that grew and, and got better. Um, the, you've, got, you've got receivers who are going to be around and make plays, and the Sammy Watkins notwithstanding to see what happens with him. Obviously, you got one of the best tight ends <laughs> that, that we've ever seen in, in Travis Kelsey. The quarterback makes a lot of sense. He's okay. Chris Jones <laughs> is going to be a big key about mm -hmm. what's going on. But now there's an atmosphere and a belief with that, with that franchise, and a guy like Tyron Matthew mm -hmm. attracts other <laughs> good free agents. Guys like that who are there – People want to be in that atmosphere. People like to be around winners, not just because they're wearing the Super Bowl ring, but how they carry themselves every day. Man. That's why I think they're set up for an extended run. You get a head coach at 61, 62 years old that, that skews young. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, you got you got you got you got some of the best fan support that's going to be out there. Uh, I think that they're set up for a chance to have a very good run. But as we all know, it's hard to do in this league. And obviously, one of those guys that's going to try and help build another championship roster, Mike Borgonzi. Mike. It's been kind of a whirlwind for you guys over the last few yeah. weeks, going from the Super Bowl to the parade yeah. and then right back into meetings. Just what have the last few weeks been like for you guys? Uh, busy. Uh, good busy, though. Um, you know, obviously this whole month, we, you know, from the Super Bowl to the parade, um, you know, we had the, the uh, parade on Wednesday, then got right into the draft meetings on Thursday, and then we had two weeks of meetings uh, and then <laughs> right to the combine. So, um, you know, bit of an adjustment. We were probably about a week behind with our draft prep, with our draft meetings, but yeah. – um, we'll, we'll take this adjustment every year. <laughs> Is it grind? And I always kind of know when you, you and your staff and 
everybody's kind of going through the tape because you guys always come into the lunchroom and you yeah. have that gla like glazed look like you've been sitting in a dark room in watching dark film room. all yeah. morning yeah. you get just, that light and you're like oh <laughs> <laughs> you just kind of nobody talks you just kind of stare at the wall yeah right just, is that the, like the biggest grind of the year for you guys when you're like just cranking on tape yeah, or is I mean, it camp it, or what is it it's well definitely during that time because you're, you're in that room for two i mean literally sometimes 14 to you know, 16 days, depending <laughs> on how the meetings go. Yeah. And it's an all-day process. I mean, we're sitting in there just uh, watching film, discussion, uh, discussing players. Um, the, the film was constantly going. Um, so, yeah, it's, uh, it, it's, it, there's a lot of work being done in, 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 that, in that draft room at that time. But, uh, but it's, uh, it's, it's enjoyable, though. We love it. And I want to get into the details of that stuff because that's what I nerd out on is just kind of like the processes, not necessarily like how much do you like this player or that player. I, yeah. Trust me, I like that stuff too. Yeah. But just kind of figuring out like what your process and just how you guys go about your business. But I want to jump back to the parade real quick mm -hmm. uh, because I always enjoy asking like what was your favorite part of the parade? Like what was your favorite moment? What was your favorite like experience part Actually, of it? Actually, you know, having my family up there because yeah. we didn't know the setup of – of um of how those double deckers were going to be and that we could bring our family up there i mean could you imagine an experience i mean we have a five-year-old joey and, and, yep. and my daughter nina who's three years old and of course my wife was up there too the experience they had uh you know to go through that it was just yeah. it, it was awesome so for me it was just being there with my family my kids and and having them take it all in was was uh it was special. I think I saw Jill. I think she was enjoying yeah, the whole yeah, thing. And I think yeah. it's, it's cool because, like, sometimes you might lose perspective on just how special it is until yeah. you're around someone that you obviously care about a lot that, that is in it for the first time and just seeing yeah. kind of their face and the way they react. Because that's my biggest takeaway is just the, the parade in general, just seeing how into it Kansas City was. Because oh, yeah. we're down in Miami and yeah. you get kind of I mean, lose perspective and you come back and right. you start seeing all the people on the – the overpasses when we landed, like coming back, it was cool. It was I, mean, we, we, I mean, we're so we're so fortunate to have, you know, this, I've been here 11 seasons now. And, it, you know, I might be biased, but I think it's the best fan base in national football. Like, I mean, it's, it's I mean, the, the, the Chiefs kingdom, the support that they give us, uh, no one deserved it more than that city and that fan base. Yeah. Now I want to jump back to the grind and <laughs> what you guys have yeah. been doing. What's, when you guys are preparing for the combine and going through and setting your board and going through those 14 to 16 days, like what does a typical day look like? How does the morning start, afternoon? How is it kind of segmented throughout the day? It comes a little bit like Groundhog Day a little bit because, I mean, <laughs> of course we're doing different players in different positions every day, but it's um, we've gone through this process now for about seven, eight years. Of course, every we tweak it a little bit every year, but, uh, you know, the process we have is we, we just, you know, literally just peel a player off the board. Uh, we talk about every player uh, that our scouts go through the fall and, and deem draftable. Um, so we'll take the player off the board. Get, we'll give our chance and the area scout a chance to talk about the player's background. Mm -hmm. We'll put the film on. Uh, you know, if we'll talk about any issues, w w any off-field issues that the guy might have, any any issues learning football, is he a scheme fit? Uh, and then we'll discuss the players. And, and it's one of those meetings. It's like you know, check your ego at the door yeah. because um, it is an inclusive meeting. Everybody has a voice in it. Um, of course, we give the area scout their due to, to talk about the player first, but we've all gone through this process so much that at the end of the day, it's about getting the player right for the Kansas City Chiefs. It's not what one person thinks. I mean, we're going to have a lot of discussions between those meetings right up until April on um, players, but at the end of the day, it's, it's about getting that player right. One of the guys on your guys' staff, uh, Trey Cozio, told me something a few years ago that I never forgot, because I used to ask him, and I've asked you guys this question before, is how do you find out, a, how do you determine the player that, that loves the game of football and not just loves that the fact that they're good at football? in college and kind of separating that and he told me a story about how as an area scout you go to a practice on a tuesday afternoon yep. in the middle of the like the season when got, like a team isn't doing too well you see how hard a guy's practicing then so for you guys how much are you then relying on those area scouts and the stuff that the people that fans never see to give you the important information that you need to make those decisions to build your boards to try to bring in the right guys to the organization the, the information that our area scouts I mean, they are the lifeblood of our organization, those area scouts. Uh, the work that they do behind the scenes to put this roster together is, is, is vital to our success. Without them, we cannot do it. Um, so for them to go in there during the fall, you know, being away from their families all the time, uh, going school to school, hotel to hotel, and be able to go to practices like Trey was talking about and, and see those things that we could never see. Yeah. You know, we, we, we're not there at the school. Um, so those are the questions that we need to get answered, and, and, and they help us come to those, those answers. So, I mean, the work that they do, um, and, and we have a, a great staff. Yeah. The, um, 
when you go through each individual player and you peel them off, how much time are you spending on each guy before you move on? It probably varies uh, on which guy it is, but generally about how much time are you spending? I mean, we, we never put a time limit on a player. It depends okay. on the player, like you're saying. Uh, we might go through a player that, you know, the, the background, the football character, the personal character, he's the Chiefs fit, we, he's good to go. And then we turn on the film and we agree as, as a group, you know, that's the grade that the scout put on a player, and then we put that player to bed during the meeting. Um, but then, you know, we might have a player that, uh, that we need to talk through a lot of issues, whether they be off the field issues, medical issues, problems, learning football, are they a scheme fit? Um, or, you know, we could have differences of opinions on the player. So sometimes we'll watch a couple of games on a player, and sometimes we might end up watching six or seven. <laughs> um, so it's, it's phase one of the process of watching the film. We're going to have other meetings watching the film here in the next couple of months, but uh, it really varies from, from player to player. Do you ever kind of joke around with the guys and just <laughs> you spend so much time looking at hundreds and some, in some cases thousands of players for the area scouts, whittling them down to the 337 that are here at the Combine, and knowing that you may get guys down the road, but the work you're doing is really to get maybe six to eight, six, like six to ten players yeah. in this draft, maybe yeah. some priority free agents, but spending so much time on so many guys who aren't going to be a part of it to, to just make sure you get it right on the few. So a lot of the process, too, is eliminating players. <laughs> yeah. From, from, you know, we get down to this 337 now. Now we have so many uh, questions that we need answered here, um, whether they be answered in the interviews, um, you know, whether their their learnings, what we want, um, you know, whether their speed or measurements are what we want, um, the medical piece too. So a, a lot of the process too is, you know, we have all or there's 337 players here now, is eliminating some of those players to get rid of the, the clutter and then yeah. focusing back in the next couple of months on the players that we we might select. I know we followed you around a little bit last year, and you did this stuff with the franchise guys. Um, you do it again this year, but what is a typical day look like for you here in India? I know it's a little different this year with the schedule yeah. um, being a little different, but what does a typical day look like? So a typical day, we, we get up and we go right to weigh-ins. Uh, mm -hmm. Weigh-ins at 7 o'clock in the morning. Uh, we're all there, front and center. Um, and um, <laughs> Thanks so to Kunal. Thanks to Kunal. Who, <laughs> we got to give a little shout-out to Kunal. Well, we'll give him a big shout-out. Okay. I think he actually sleeps in this building to get us those seats. <laughs> Uh, so shout out to Canal for, for all that and all the work he does. You know, we couldn't function without Canal. Um, but, yeah, so we'll go to Wayne's. Uh, and the way they have it this year, too, is uh, we're going to do the interviews now late morning, early afternoon, do the interview piece, and yeah. then have the field work at night. So really that's, you know, they just flip the interviews and the, and the field work, which I think is great. I think it's great for the fans now who, who love the offseason part of football. Uh, you know, people are fanatic about the sport, and we can't, you know, have this without the fans. Uh, gives them a chance, you know, that Thursday and Friday to, to tune in when they get home from work. You know, a lot of times it was in the morning that we're doing the field yeah. work and it was on TV and they couldn't watch it. So, no, I think it's great, you know, a little bit of an adjustment for us, but it's great for the fans. Do you, do you think it's better then that you guys aren't doing interviews with the players late at night like you've done in the past? It's just these days are grueling for those guys yeah. and those players. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, <laughs> because some of those interviews took place around 10, 30, 11 o'clock at night after a full day sitting in MRI, MRI <laughs> tubes and, yeah. and, and field work and all that stuff. So, I mean, yeah, I, I think it might actually benefit the uh, the interview process, just <laughs> those guys being more awake. Yeah. Uh, the, um, the evaluation process, in addition to going through your draft board the last 14 to 16 days, one of the other things that I find really interesting that you guys have to do is balance – the look that you guys get and the evaluation you've done of like the free agency class and like yeah. what players could be available in free agency and then compare that to the draft yeah. and just kind of marry those two things where you know if if you need some depth in one position and it's light in free agency to then look at the draft and see if that's a place where you can make decisions just how much do you guys have to rely on like the, the pro and the, the college side and the guys who diff who are tasked with being in charge of different areas of, of the personnel staff to, to have that communication back and forth to, to find the strengths and weaknesses of both those areas to make the best decision possible. Yeah, so the great that makes thing, sense. Yeah, no, the great thing about how we work, and it's not like this everywhere, is our, our pro scouting staff and our college scouting staff work together. Mm -hmm. Our pro scouting staff is in our college meetings. Um, so they have a, a, a really good idea of the draft. So we start our draft meetings in December really really to start this process of, of marrying the free agency and the draft, really to get um, you know, market value for players in free agency, you know, comparing the depth at one position in free agency versus the draft. A lot of teams would rather go to the draft and draft young players. So if a position yeah. is really heavy in the draft, it usually affects – you know, uh, the market of, of that position in free agency. So um, it's an important process, and it, and it helps that we all work together on a daily basis so well and together. Um, so, yeah, and that's a big part of it. 
I want to ask, and this might be putting you on the spot a little bit, but I love stories and just finding like the behind the scenes little nuggets. When you guys were going through this process last year with the draft class and knowing what kind of success they had, when you were evaluating guys like McCole Hardman and Juan Thornhill, Colin yeah. Saunders, Rashad Fenton, guys who stepped up, even Darwin Thompson, stepped up and made an impact. Are there any stories or situations or things you just remember about any of those four or five guys going through the process that you can sit back on and be like we i remember sitting looking at juan thornhill tape in this play is there anything with those guys that stands out to you when it got to the draft time is like i love that dude well i think anytime you draft a player you're hoping that skill set carries over you like that skill set in college so for a guy like Juan, it was his, his range, his ball skills, mm -hmm. um, his ability to always be around the football, and I think that carried over till this season. <laughs> um, so we, every time he makes a play this season during the rookie year, I'm like, oh, I remember that. You know, in Virginia, he made that play on the ball, and he had this interception. So, and the same thing with McColl. Yep. You know, we saw a guy that just had explosive playmaking ability, and it carried over this year. Um, and, and those guys are constantly going to get better and they have areas to improve, but um, – but those are the things you remember, um, the, the different skill sets, that, that that's why you drafted that player. And then they come yep. and they make the same type of play at the next level. Um, so, you know, guys like even, even Colin Saunders, who, who a small school kid from Western Illinois, uh, took him a little while to get in the rotation. But once you saw him got in the, get in there, it was the point of attack snap first to run. It was his quickness and agility to make plays down the line of scrimmage. And you started to see that later in the season. Yeah. So. I think his first NFL start was against Quentin Nelson, too. I think he got yeah. a, a so welcome he, to the yeah, NFL right, yeah, facing that guy from Western Illinois. Yeah. Um, but this particular draft class, um, not players, but just what stands out, what's unique about this group of players this year? Well, first of all, it's a, it's a really good draft overall. Yeah. You know, we, we said that once we got done with meetings, we're like, wow, this, this is a pretty good draft. Mm -hmm. um, you know, really deep in certain positions. Um, I can tell you it's deep. It's a deep wide receiver class. I'm, I'm sure all, everybody's talking about it in the meeting, yeah. too. So uh, deep wide receiver that class. That secret's out. Yeah, that secret's <laughs> out. You know, deep tackle class. Uh, it's a good mm -hmm. corner class. So th there's really depth along the entire uh, position group here in the draft and uh you know it's it's exciting well, one thing that brett and i talked about last year was how much easier he thinks things were going to be as far as going into free agency coming off mahomes mvp season and just the the older veteran players guys just want to play for him because you know they're going to be good um now they're coming off a super bowl victory and you've got had even more success and granted, that process is still kind of ongoing. It's always ongoing. But do you foresee there being just more phone calls coming your way or just the, the idea of coming to play for the Chiefs could be different coming off that Super Bowl win and maybe be able to help get some more talent here? Yeah, I mean, you're always trying to build a culture that people want to be a part of. Yeah. Um, and I think that's been a process here for a while. And I think we got to that point where, you know, we got to the highest level and we won the Super Bowl. So people want to be a part of that. Um, so, yeah, uh, you know, I, I think there are going to be people that want to play here and want to play with Pat Mahomes and, you know, want to play for a coach like Andy Reid. And, um, yeah, it's an exciting time to, to be a part of the Chiefs kingdom. What's your favorite part about this whole experience being here in Indy? <laughs> um, you know what's cool is, is it's a small network of people in the league and you get to see yeah. a lot of friends that you haven't seen in a while. Um, and there's different events during the year, but this, this is a cool event just to kind of catch up with people that, that you know and that you've been friends with over the years. All right, and last question before we let you go. Just what does a su successful week look like for you guys? When, when this is all said and done, what, what can you hang your hat on? So we're really here to get questions answered, right? So we have this list of questions, whether they be during the measurements, you know, how, how tall is this guy? How much does he weigh? Mm -hmm. What's he going to run the 40 in? So we knock that out during the testing part and the field work. And then we have the interview process. Can this guy learn? Is this the type of player we want in our culture? Yeah. Try to get that answered. And then, of course, the medical piece, which the whole combine was, was created for the medical piece. Yeah. Is this guy going to be healthy enough uh, for us to play? Um, so it's really about getting those questions answered at the end of the day, and that makes it a successful week. As many of those questions you can get answered, that's a you know, successful week for us. No, you guys have been getting answers to those questions, and it's obviously been successful having one of the top draft classes uh, across the league last year with the guys that we just mentioned, along with the free agents that you guys brought in and the guys you picked up during the season. Uh, Brett talked about it earlier today. Just 12 new contributors to that defense uh, yeah. that all stepped up and were able to help get the Super Bowl victory. Uh, Mike, we appreciate your time joining us here on In the Trenches. We've got another episode coming up on Friday where I'll be joined by co-host Therese Paler as we talk more drafts specific and talk about some of the workouts some of the guys that have stood out and some of the buzz going on around here in indy we appreciate everybody for listening we'll see you on friday
This is the Chiefs' official podcast network.